What's up, guys? Hope everybody's doing well and uh, and having a good week. Um, I hope you're going to join us tonight for youth group at 5:30 on Zoom. Uh, I sent out the Zoom ID and the password earlier this week. If you need help getting on Zoom and connecting with everyone, uh, please let me know. I'll be happy to get you there, um, and we'd love to see you. We're just going to hang out, play some games, uh, maybe pray together. Uh, should be a great time. I just miss you guys, and I want to see everybody and, and hang out. So I look forward to uh, to youth group tonight. Um, we're going to be back in the Minor Prophets this week as part of our, our study as we've continued to kind of go through book by book uh, with the Minor Prophets. Last week we took a, a break for a Holy Week, but we're back in uh, with the book of Zephaniah uh, this week. Since it's been two weeks since we've done the Minor Prophets, I'll put up the one word uh, summary uh, so that we can kind of get a reminder of where we've been. Um, Last week, we talked about the book of Nahum. Two weeks ago, we talked about the book of Nahum. That was all about vengeance. It was all about God's vengeance being taken on the nation of Assyria, who had conquered the northern kingdom, but was kind of taking it to uh, way too harsh and violent a level. And God sends uh, the, the message of vengeance against the Assyrians, that God is going to judge uh, the people of Nineveh. And this was a message of comfort to, uh, to the exiled people the people that had been sent out of northern Israel. As we move to Zephaniah today, it's sort of a shift. What we're doing is kind of shifting as we go through kind of the historical timeline of the Old Testament. And I know that the history and the dates and the places kind of gets people a little bit hung up. So I want to be careful to not throw out too many things and terms here. But it is important that you know the historical context. Remember, Israel was split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. This is the, the same people that God brought out of Egypt. This is the same people that David was the king uh, over. The nation of Israel has been split. And then in the north and in the south, uh, the north and the south both go through years of turning away from God, of pagan idol worship. Uh, the word of the god Baal uh, is, is prevalent as a pagan god that they turn to worship uh, because of their relationships with other nations. Uh, which God warned them against. Um, and because of that, God is going to judge his people, Israel, and he's going to do it by using these other nations to conquer the, the nation of Israel and to exile the people, which means just to send them out um, around uh, the region and, and to send them into a place where they don't have a home. And so that is what exile is. And so um, he first does it to the northern kingdom because they are worse. They're way worse than the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel is, is really, really bad. And so he sends the nation of Assyria to conquer them. We talked about Assyria uh, in the book of Nahum. And so that has happened. This is where we are now. Uh, just think of it as like one of those mall maps. If you remember going to the mall, it seems like 50 years ago that we went to a mall. But if you remember on the mall map, like you have that little sticker, that star that says you are here. Uh, that's what I'm doing right now. This is this is where we are in the history. This is the you are here of the minor prophets. So the northern kingdom has been conquered by Assyria. God has given his judgment on Assyria, and he has raised up Babylon. Babylon's another nation, and Babylon comes along, conquers the Assyrians, and sort of takes over as the predominant empire in the world. That's sort of where we are. And so now... Um, the judgment has been given northern Israel. Northern Israel has been exiled. And now God is going about to bring judgment on the southern kingdom. So we're shifting gears. Uh, we've dealt primarily with northern kingdom stuff so far. When we talk about Nahum, talked about a lot of Micah, um, Amos, and Joel, um, Jonah certainly. Like we're dealing with, Jonah's a little different. But of all those ones we've talked about, we're dealing with northern kingdom stuff. This is all um, northern kingdom, Assyria. Uh, Samaria, all of those things is what we've dealt with to this point. Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, and so now we're going to shift gears to the southern kingdom, the southern kingdom, which is called Judah. And uh, the nation, the, the, the southern kingdom of Judah, the capital is Jerusalem. That's where Jerusalem is. Uh, that's where the temple is, if you remember uh, of the stories of the temple throughout the Old Testament. Um, and that is the... Um, that's kind of where we find ourselves. We're shifting to the southern kingdom, the southern kingdom of Judah um, and Jerusalem. And so we're going to, through Zephaniah, next week we'll talk about Habakkuk. Two weeks from now we'll talk about Haggai. Those three books deal with the southern kingdom and, uh, and, and, and really where uh, the southern kingdom, which has had uh, some faithful kings, uh, they have had some good years. 
um, but really a lot of bad years. And that's why God is still bringing on judgment of the southern kingdom. So that's where we are. I know that was a little bit of a long intro, but that's where we are as we get into the book of Zephaniah. And, uh, and really, uh, Zephaniah is going to pick up on a lot of the same themes we've talked about. Uh, they are the major themes of the minor prophets, the themes of God's wrath, God's judgment, but also God's grace and love uh, in the midst of that, the, 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 the hope of restoration that is to come. Um, and, and so these are all the major themes, and Zephaniah certainly picks up on all of them. But Zephaniah has got a few unique qualities, too, that I think are definitely worth studying and worth knowing. Um, as we talk about with these books of the Minor Prophets, the goal is to get us a little bit of comfort with them so that you know what's going on, so that when you read the book of Zephaniah, you don't get so bogged down in trying to figure out where we are, uh, but really you can read and understand and appreciate a little bit of what these books are. That's the goal of the study. So let's look at Zephaniah. Um, I'm going to read just verse 1 to kind of get us started. We're going to read a lot more of the book, primarily in chapter 3, but I just want to read the first verse to get us a little bit of context into where we are. So let's read verse 1 of chapter 1, and I'll put it up on the screen if you have a Bible. Uh, this is That's the preferred thing. If you have your own Bible, go get it uh, and uh, open to the book of Zephaniah, and um, we will uh, we'll look at it together. So I'm going to be reading from the ESV. Uh, translation, and uh, let's read Zephaniah 1.1, 1, 1, and I'll pray briefly, and then we'll, we'll get into it. This is God's word from Zephaniah. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. That is God's word. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us in this time. Uh, that was a lot of names and a lot of places and a lot of dates and a lot of facts. And sometimes we get bogged down in those things. Um, I just ask that you would help us to not get bogged down. Uh, open our ears, open our eyes to what you would have us learn from Zephaniah. We ask for your help. We pray uh, in the name of Christ that you would help us by your Holy Spirit. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, so the book of Zephaniah, as we read in the first verse, and remember, these first verses are vitally important in the Minor Prophets. The first verse, the first, you know, this like introduction that all of the Minor Prophets books really have gives us a little bit of insight into what time period we're talking about. Uh, and it gives us a little bit of an insight as to who the prophet uh, is, a little bit of an idea of who this uh, who the minor prophet is. And so we have in the first verse, the word of the Lord that comes to Zephaniah, and we've got the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, uh, the son of Hezekiah. That's just a little bit of a genealogy of, of Zephaniah. To avoid us getting too confused, I'm going to avoid going into all of that. But the important note at the end of verse one is that it says that it's in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah. This gives us context as to who we're talking about and where we're talking about. Number one, we're talking about the southern kingdom. Uh, it says that he's the king of Judah, Josiah being the king of Judah uh, here. And uh, and it gives us a little bit of a sense of the time period. Uh, there, The story of Judah is long and complicated and interesting. Uh, but basically, you have a series of kings, some of them really bad, some of them really good. Um, and for two different kings in a row, Manasseh and Ammon, those are two kings in a row that you can read about. They were both really bad kings. They both really promoted Baal worship, pagan worship. They turned the people of God away from God. Um, and so after Manasseh and Ammon have done this, then Josiah becomes the king about when he's about eight years old, I think. Josiah becomes the king of Israel or the king of Judah. And he is a good king. He tries to bring about reform. He tries to bring the people of God back to God and, and really does a, a lot of really good things. The problem is, is that they have been turned away from God for so long. There's been such bad things happening uh, that at this point it can't be fixed. The judgment of God is still coming on Judah, despite the fact that, that Judah uh, has been uh, put into this period of reformed reform by Josiah. And actually, Josiah is going to be killed in a battle because the people of Judah have, have still kind of uh, resisted this reform. And so this is all kind of what happens. All this history, you can go back and read about it in the books of the Kings and the Chronicles. But 
this is what happens with Josiah. And Josiah is a good king, but Josiah cannot fix the problem that's been developing for, for generations in Judah. And that's why God's judgment is coming. So this is who Zephaniah is prophesying to. It's to Judah. While all this reform is going on, and the warnings of Zephaniah are, are, are coming to Judah. So if you read through chapter 1 and and um, and then chapter 2, like it's just a lot of judgment. It's a lot of wrath that's coming on Judah. Um, it's really interesting in chapter 1 uh, how God almost does a reversal of creation, uh, of the creation narrative from Genesis 1. This is how he describes it, the wrath that's going to come on them when he says in verse 3, I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the heavens. Uh, I will sweep away the fish of the sea. Uh, you see how he's using creation language uh, as kind of the judgment is going to be so severe that he is going to reverse all that was done in creation. And that's kind of the, the kind of the idea here is that um, the wrath of God is coming upon Judah, who has warped and turned everything that God created for good, everything that God has done for them um, in Jerusalem, in the temple, in their history. They are undoing all of that. They have undone all of that. They've turned away from God. They're worshiping pagan gods. And because of that, God's going to bring his wrath and judgment upon them. And so that's where we kind of find ourselves. And I want to fast forward to chapter three, because chapter three, it's the last chapter of the book. Chapter three is really where this thing takes a turn. And it's really the most important thing to take away from Zephaniah. In chapter three, you have... Um, this message after all of this judgment, all of this wrath, uh, where it, it kind of flips a little bit. It flips to, um, to, to where God kind of says, the fire that I'm going to bring down upon Judah, the fire that I'm going to bring down, the wrath that I'm going to bring down is not for destruction. It is for purification. And that's an incredibly important thing, is that God's wrath here is not coming for uh, judgment. It's coming for purification. He says in verse 9 of chapter 3, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve them with one and serve him with one accord. God talks about gathering the nations. This is not just about Judah. This is about the nations. This is about the world. This is about uh, all corners of the world, every tribe and tongue coming to this place where God's going to make their speech a pure speech and they're going to come and they're going to serve God with one accord. Um, and this is sort of the, the vision that's given. Uh, that in the midst of all this judgment, in the midst of all this wrath, God is going to bring about grace and restoration and love, not just to Judah, but he's going to use Judah as an example to bring all of this to the nations, to gather the nations. And this is a fulfillment of the promise that God made back in Genesis, that the nation of Israel, that the, the family of Abraham was going to be uh, it was going to be a family made up of all nations, made up of all peoples, and, and it's going to number the stars, and it's going to match the number of stars in the sky. Like, this is the promise. It's the fulfillment of the promise that was made to Abraham, and that's an amazing, amazing thing that the nations are being brought in, uh, even though the judgment is coming upon Judah. Uh, if you skip down to verse 15 of chapter 9, it says, The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. Um, and this, so, so we have this message of wrath and judgment against Judah, of God's wrath and judgment against the nations, and then again about God's wrath and judgment against Judah. But then in verse 3, it flips to this whole idea of the fact that this judgment is not for destruction, it's for purification. And then at the end of the book, as I just read 15, it, it, it flips to this whole message of the joy and restoration of Israel. And this is really where I want us to see and land kind of the point of the book of Zephaniah. God's going to use the judgment of Judah, violent and, and horrific as it may be. And really, Zephaniah does use some of the most vivid language of any of the minor prophets to talk about the judgment that's coming on Judah uh, but but it ends where all these books of the minor prophets do with this message of joy and restoration, and and, and it's and it's not just found in the basic idea that God is going to relent His anger, but it's based in the idea that God is preparing for His people a nation and a place uh, where none of these things uh, are going to be 
uh, a problem. None of the things that are ailing them, none of the things that are that are are are, are making the world uh, a dangerous and scary place. None of the things that God has brought about wrath and judgment for this world. That's not that. This is not going to be. Uh, the world that they are promised is not going to be the world that they're looking to. And so it's this message of what is to come, not just a matter of God will relent his anger. And if you read verse 17, that's really where, uh, that's really the main, the main verse that I want you to focus on. The Lord, your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. This is the main message of the book of Zephaniah to the people of God. This is the main encouragement, is this idea that God is coming to restore the nation of Israel. And when he does, God himself is going to be in their midst. Uh, the, the way the ESV translates it is, the Lord your God is in your midst. Other translations would say, the Lord your God will live among you. The Lord your God will dwell among you. This is the basic idea, and so it's pointing to a time when God himself is going to dwell with his people. And not only that, but after saving them, he is going to rejoice over them. He's going to quiet them by his love. He's going to exalt over them with loud singing. And so this is the picture that we have, is that God is going to bring this remnant. God is going to bring this chosen people uh, from the nations, gathering this chosen people from the nations to himself, and in that time, he's going to gather them, and he's going to be in their midst, and he's going to dwell among them. This obviously points us forward to the longing for a day when God is going to dwell among his people, and this obviously points our minds and our eyes to Jesus Christ. Um, I re, I, I, this The verse comes to my mind all the time, but I think it's one of the most profound verses of the Bible in John 1.14, where he says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. This idea that the God of the universe, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was there in the beginning, who is God himself, came and dwelt among us. He came and lived among us. He came and lived as one of us, even though without sin. And so this is the message of the gospel. Zephaniah is the message of the gospel. God's wrath and judgment is coming. Why? Because God hates sin. God hates sin. He hates the injustices of those, this world. He hates the things of this world that make uh, this creation, this world hard for us. He hates that. And so there has to be judgment on that. There has to be wrath being poured out for not only the things that are done to us, but the things that we do, uh, the sin that we do. Uh, but on top of that, while God's wrath and God's judgment is fierce and swift and it is and it is true, God's love and God's grace to his people is just as swift and just as true and just as powerful, if not more so, because God is a God of compassion. And so, again, this is the idea here in Zephaniah. Not only is there going to be a day when the Lord himself will dwell among us uh, and, and he will quiet us by his love and he will exalt over us with singing. And this is pointing us to a day when the forgiveness of God is going to come uh, for sin, and it's going to be because it's going to be poured out on one who is going to take the punishment of that sin, uh, so that he can exalt over us with singing, so that he can look at us and uh, and 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 rejoice with gladness. Because when he looks at you, uh, if you're in Christ, when he looks at you, he sees righteousness, he sees beauty, he sees perfection. That is the message of the gospel. That's what justification is. That's what we talked about in Romans, is this idea that when God looks at you, he sees righteousness. He rejoices over you with gladness, because when he looks at you, you're the most beautiful thing he's ever seen. It's Jesus Christ, the one who has taken the punishment for your sin on the cross. And then ultimately, these verses in Zephaniah point us forward to a day when we will be able to live and once uh, live in the midst of God forever, uh, when Jesus returns, we are made into glorified bodies. These bodies, the, this this glorification, the 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 um, the thing that we have been promised in our justification, in our faith, uh, pointing us forward to a day when we can live in the midst of God as righteous, uh, glorified beings, uh, and we can truly join in 
as he exalts over us with loud singing. This is the point of Zephaniah. This is the point of the gospel. And so it's a beautiful message. Zephaniah 3 is a uh, is a passage and a chapter that is just mind-blowing, and it's beautiful. So let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for the book of Zephaniah. Thank you for this message of the gospel. Uh, we pray that we'd be transformed by it, that we would know that by faith in Christ, we can indeed receive the promises of Zephaniah 3. Uh, and we may one day see, um, see you in our midst. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, thanks for joining me. Uh, I'll see you tonight at Youth Group. And uh, yeah, I, I look forward to uh, look forward to hanging out. Take care. Bye.